Interesting. Now, what would you say? Now, we talked about a little bit about um, a healthy athlete, you know, say a younger yeah. athlete who doesn't have it, and we talked about the benefits they would get uh, from doing flexion exercises, and maybe what they might lack from not doing them. You know. Yeah. What about the average guy like, uh, let's say, you know, yourself, for instance? You travel, and, and, if, and I, I didn't. I probably didn't give Mark the the, uh, the ample introduction. Mark is one of the, the world, a world-renowned physical therapist, researcher, and um, you know he's definitely one of one of the top dogs you can get in the physical therapy world. So you're not, you're, you guys are lucky here. You're getting information from one of the, one of the best in the world. So, um, what would you say for someone like yourself who who flies from Australia to the United States regular basis? You're sitting in prolonged flexion for a long period of time. You're doing research. I'm sure you're writing papers and writing our books and things. So, what would you say to a trainer who might be training guys like yourself, who are, who may not have the, the best posture, or whatever? Yeah. We sit too much, and we might not get to ex get to the gym as much. Would you still encourage someone like yourself to do flexion exercises if you don't have necessarily reoccurring back pain yeah. or past disc yeah. surgeries? No problems because there's, there's lots of flex activities where you use. If I reach over here to throw anything, if I playing with my kids, you know, like. Um, if I'm picking something up and putting it over there, you know, like if I reach back and I'm going to play anything up, you know, like there's some times you actually use flexion in a loaded way, and, but you don't need to overload it. So, but I think what I need to look for is that if you get, if, if flexion is a provocative movement, then you want to train the back extension to provide better control of it. So don't avoid stopping flexing, provide some better control of it. There are ways we can now look at is flexion just type of mobile, or is flexion mobile and uncontrolled, and that puts more stress on tissues than the movement that is controlled. If you've got extension pain, I'd be actively encouraging people to increase the recruitment and the training of their anti-flexion muscles, the abdominal, oblique abdominals in particular, to provide some decelerator mechanism for extension and functional movement. So if you, if you lean back and look overhead, you can't do that without using your oblique abdominals, to provide eccentric control of extension in the same way that when you bend forward, the back extension is providing eccentric control of flexion. Sure. So, you know, I, 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 I encourage people to train within their functional demands. So if you're fairly sedentary and you don't need to play sport, you're not playing a lot of active sport, then the loading level you need to do is obviously going to be much lower than an athlete. Right. But you still need to be able to control the movement you've got. And if you're, and if you're spending a lot of time in static extension, or static flexion, or static rotation, and you get aches and pains or discomfort associated with that, then they're the early warning signs that you've got maybe uncontrolled movement. And we want to go and look at we can assess for what is the quality of the control system like? Is it up to the job? Right. And and making people move more regularly is a very positive thing. Very positive thing. Okay. Movement is what pushes love to relieve to relieve stress. The way to relieve this stress is to move. Absolutely. Let this uh, guy go by here. Well, one last question I wanted to ask you about this, and then we're going to move on to talk about some unstable base training. Can you talk to me a little bit about, you were talking to me about actually some people that have disc injuries that actually get relieved, you know, pain relief by flexion. Yeah. Did I get that right? Yeah, and yeah, you yeah, talk about yeah. that at the bar. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Here. okay. so not all discs are provoked by flexion. If you've got a big posterior bulge and pushing on the nerve root with the leg pain, you often have the disc bulge at the back because of uncontrolled flexion combined with uncontrolled rotation. Okay. And it's been, and it's often, and most of the people who get these problems haven't injured themselves in a loaded incident. They've, they've got the pain coming from a static thing and a, or a sudden unguarded movement. The unguarded movement is a much greater risk than the loaded movement, I believe. But the, um, the problem is that not all discs are, have the tears at the back. There are annular tears around the rim. Most of those are, most of those annular tears, in my experience, when I assess people with annular tears, when I for what uncontrolled movement they've got, they've got uncontrolled extension. And when they extend, they have a shearing mechanism. So the pelvis sways forward and the trunk sways back. The common movement movement fault in in, in in people who spend a lot of time sitting and then intermittently are active. <laughs> That's which most of society nowadays. We all sit at desks and work work in that sort of environment nowadays. So, so that's a bigger risk. And but those people are the people who will find that their pain is provoked by standing with the pelvis swayed forward and the trunk swayed back. If they stay there, that's going to hurt them. They find that their, their single best relief for that deep, that deep back pain, that dyskinetic pain, that's deep radiating out across the back, is to curl up in a ball. 
So if you're having a ball, make your pain better, then you need to train more flexion as part of the relief mechanism for that particular disc injury. Absolutely. Absolutely. Not all of that pain. Not, don't assume that all extension pain is the joint. That's not true. We can assess the joint pain. What happens? They cut very well with that. So, you know, like, think of the extension, extension stress on the disc. This is bad as the flexion stress in a lot of people. And, so it's, and that's great stuff. And what it really comes down to is this. You got to treat everybody specifically, from, especially from a physical therapist perspective, but even from a you know a strength conditioning perspective. I originally thought, before talking to Mark and a few other qualified physical therapists, that yeah, for the average person, you know, they may have a herniated disc and they don't know it because they don't have any symptoms of it, which is common. Um, EMGs are showing them that now, and uh, and you know if they sit too much, maybe they already get to enough flexion. And I can get, but from talking to Mark and other people, and I've never really thought it was that big of a deal either, but um, I. You know, I see even more importance to do it, and that's how our body is designed to move, plain and simple. So actually, a lot. I told you it was the last question, but I do have one more question for you. In general, how many patients have you, you have you think you've seen and treated, or how, actually, I should say, how many back patients have you seen and treated over your your years between uh, research and, and treatment? Just throw out a number. The thousands. Okay. The thousands, yeah. Okay. Like, in the fat, yeah, in the, the back pain, yeah, like, that, absolutely. So that brings me to this question. Bread and butter. <laughs> Out of the thousands that you've, that you've treated, uh, I know you're going to be 100% honest, how many have you seen that have discs that were injured or backs that were injured from exercises like uh, crunches or sit ups or anything? The percentage will be low, less than five percent. But you have seen some far. I've seen some, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So, so it can happen. But in my experience, most people that you see people injure their discs more from bending activities where the back extensions aren't providing the control. Right. Not the abdominals being able to pull in your back. You know, like so. And the abdominals, the abdominals, the oblique abdominals, external beats in particular, are the primary rotation controllers in the core, greater than anything else. And so the oblique abdominals and the internal and external, external, external internal obliques can't control rotation. Now the internal obliques attach at the back of the pelvis. The internal obliques attach along the posterior iliac crest right to the sacrum and PSIS. So when you bend forward, the internal obliques are providing rotation control along with the back of the pelvis. When you bend back, the external obliques are providing yeah. rotation control right, yeah. along with the other abdominals. And that combination is, is a great design. They sit like this. Wow. But the contractile fibers, the internal obliques go right around the back without any anatomy depth. And they and they are posterior muscles that are active when you lean forward and controlling rotation. So there's a there's a whole right there's, so the oblique abdominals are often sort of you know, like misrepresented or they are ill considered right. in terms of the their ability to do things and the, and and we want to retrain them. We want to retrain those abilities to control rotation, flexion. An extension back. And speaking of rotation, in that rehab, when you saw those people that actually were injured, back injuries by these exercises like flexion, did, did any flexion exercises show up towards the end of them being discharged from you? Did you ever go bring them back or did you just tell them that they couldn't do it? Absolutely, you can't live without flexion. So I reconditioned everyone back through flexion if flexion was a provocative movement. So I think it's important in early rehab to protect the provocative movement. Right. So flexion is a provocative movement, we need to protect it and keep, stay, keep the core neutral and minimize flexion loading and flexion, um, uh, flexion movement. Sure, uh, as soon as the acute, acute inflammatory phase is over, and once we're now getting people back into function, they've got to move and flex. And if they're going to return to sport, it's a, I think it's critical to recondition them through those movements. So we have to train not just the neutral core and add load to the neutral core to strengthen it. We also need to train the core to move out of neutral. So, so re retraining the functional stability of the non-neutral core is equally critical for reconditioning to function and reconditioning to sport uh, as protecting the core and keep it neutral in the early rear phases. So, and, and, and we see people move with poor control of, neutral, of, of a non-neutral core. So when people move away from the midline, we often see them changing the sequencing pattern. So in functional movements we sequence joints, more than one joint moves in function. So when people flex, and one common thing I see in many, many people with back pain is that when they flex, they flex their head, they flex their lower neck, they flex their upper chest, they flex their thoracic lumbar junction, and then when they, when, when they do, they then just jump straight to the hips. And that flex the lumbar spine and that flex the posterior to the pelvis. So they have failure in the sequence of, of, a, of, a, of a sequential motion and rolling and rolling movement. Now, if people can fix that, no problem, but there's a lot of people that are given the instructions to try to fix that, they can't get it right. So what they've got is they've got a lack of ability to sequence through the chain 
of linked joints interesting and, and teaching, teaching them to regain the sequence. And so if I'm looking at a flexion sequence we, in, in the non-neutral core, we need to train it with the anterior muscles, making the core work sequentially against gravity with anterior muscles, and then we need to stand people up and make the posterior muscles lower the core sequentially against gravity. And so if flexion is a problem, you've got to train posterior muscles to control it from standing positions, and anterior muscles to control it from lying or leaning back positions or throwing positions, or hip flexion positions. If you have hip flex, you've got a, you've, you've got a hip flex, you've got a flex of fine. If you do hip flex at speed, hip flex at speed, hip flex is fine, and you've got to have the control system working for it. Absolutely, I couldn't do more. That's, that's, that's great stuff, guys. I really appreciate you uh, Thanks, Nick. helping out with this. This is amazing stuff. Um, we're coming back in a little bit. In the next video, we're going to talk a little bit about unstable base training.